trotted up the road toward Ned's house, but he slowed a little when he heard the potter scolding him even before he arrived. What kind of useless boy was he, coming back so late the day before, leaving the cart without a word? That wood should have been taken to the kiln and unloaded. Men had dug it himself at dusk and had nearly injured himself stumbling home in the darkness. Such help was worse than no help at all. Now, did Treher really intend to make himself useful? If not, it would be better for him to forget the whole arrangement. Finally, men paused to draw breath. Treher dared not look up. He felt like a beast with two heads, one ashamed, the other resentful. Ashamed that he had not finished the work properly. Resentful that men had not even given him complete instructions. Fill the cart. That had been the order, and he had done it. Was he expected to read men's mind as well? But the shame won out in tree ear. He feared being sent away before he could learn to make a pot. I am sorry that I displeased the honorable potter, tree ear said. If he would be so good as to give me another chance, he will not be disappointed. Hmph, men said, and turned and walked to the side of the house. Tree ear stood still, still for a moment, unsure of what to do. Well, men turned back impatiently. Are you coming, beggar boy, or are you a statue with your feet frozen to the ground? Tree Ear's joy at being forgiven was like a wisp of smoke. Men's orders for the day blew it into nothingness. His task was the same as the previous days, to fill the cart with wood, and this time unloaded at the kiln site. Each day, Tree Ear appeared at men's door eagerly. Each day, men sent him to the mountain with the cart to chop more wood. At night, with Crane Man's careful ministrations, the wound on Tree Ear's hand would begin to heal, the tender pink layer toughening slightly but at the start of the next day's work, it would split and bleed again. Tree Ear had come to expect the pain. The throbbing was like an unwelcome companion who appeared daily after the first few strokes of the axe. On the third day, Craneman had offered to come with him. Tree Ear's mind raced to think of polite refusal. He knew what would happen. Craneman would want to spare Tree Ear's blistered hand and would take up the axe himself. Tree Ear shuddered, picturing Craneman trying to chop wood while leaning on his crutch. He might well injure his good leg. Your offer of help is kindness itself, Tree Ear answered, but if it is all the same to you, it is far better for me to return to a meal already prepared. I could not imagine greater assistance than this. Crane Man looked satisfied. It seemed to Tree Ear that his friend spent the entire day trying to figure out how to transform a handful of weeds and bones into something that resembled a meal. Over the days, Tree Ear developed a routine of work and rest. A period of diligent chopping and loading, then a break. This was better than several hours of frenzied chopping that left him with a vast, untidy pile of wood, which took much time to load and left him exhausted. In the brief periods of rest, he was sometimes able to gather a little food, a few wild mushrooms here, a handful of fern sprouts there. Crane had taught him well in the many walks through the mountains together. Tree Ear knew which mushrooms were tasty and which deadly. He knew the birds by their songs, how a mountain lion spore looked different from that of a deer, and he never lost his way, for he knew where the streams ran, pointing sure as an arrow back down the mountain toward the road. Besides his quiet times reading the mountain, Trigger's favorite part of the day was unloading the wood at the kiln site. The kiln was located at the far end of the village from Men's house. Nearby was a large, roughly built shed. Trigger wheeled the cart to the shed's entry, then carried armfuls of wood inside where it could stay dry. The wood was stacked as high as a man could reach and orderly piles on either side of a central aisle. Tree Ear liked arranging the wood neatly, so the potters could take what they needed without the whole stack collapsing. At the kiln site, he often saw potters whose turn it was to use the kiln. They would greet him with a nod when he arrived. On the fourth day, one of them spoke to him. You are men's new boy, are not? Tree Ear knew the potter who spoke. His name was Kang. He was old enough for Gray to streak his hair, but younger than men. With a keen eye and restless manner, Tree Ear lowered the handles of his cart to the ground and bowed his head. High time the old man got some help. Some got himself some help. King spoke with what seemed like an edge to his voice. The last few times he did not bring anywhere near his proper share of wood. Then King stepped forward and began to help unload the cart. So Tree Ear's work was finished earlier than usual. He was left with enough time to rifle through a rubbish dump on the way home. A cabbage core that he found would add to Crane Man's culinary efforts for dinner. It was the morning of the tenth day. The evening before, Tree Ear had returned the cart to its usual spot next to Men's house and had lingered about for a few moments, but Men did not emerge from the house. 
to Tree Ear departed at last, his debt of work paid in full. Awake for most of the night, Tree Ear had considered over and over how best to approach men. In the nine days of work, Tree Ear had not once touched clay. He would never be able to make a pot unless he could continue his relationship with the potter. Tree Ear rehearsed his words one last time as he neared Nim's house. He drew the breath and held it for a moment to steady himself, then called out, Master Potter. To Tree Ear's surprise, Nim's wife opened the door. He knew, of course, that Nim was married. On the days that he had spied on men, Tree Ear had occasionally glimpsed the wife coming out to the yard to scatter grain for the chickens or fetch water, but because she had nothing to do with the pottery work, Tree Ear had ignored her, and in the past several days of wood cutting, he had not seen or thought of her at all. Now he bowed his head as he stood before her. Is the master home? he asked. He is at breakfast, she answered. You may wait at the back of the house. Tree Ear nodded his thanks and stepped away. But the woman spoke again quietly. A good thing you're chopping the wood. He is not as young as he once was. Her voice trailed off. Tree Ear glanced up at her and their eyes met. Hers were bright and soft, set in a small face netted with fine wrinkles. He dropped his gaze at once, not wishing to be considered impolite. Like Cranian's eyes, he thought, and wondered why. Ben was washing his hands in a basin under the eaves when Tree Ear reached the backyard. What are you doing here? Nin's voice was cross, and he did not look up. It has been nine days. Your debt is discharged. If you came to hear me say it, you can go now. Tree Ear bowed. I beg the Honorable Potter to pardon my insolence, he said. I wish to express my gratitude. Yes, yes, Nin was impatient. What is it? It would be great honor for me to continue working for the Potter. Tree Ear began the speech he had planned so carefully. If he would consider, I can't pay you. Min's interruption could hardly have been more abrupt, but the curt words swept over Tree Ear like cool rain over a parched field. I cannot pay you was the same as yes. A surge of joy lifted Tree Ear's heart into his throat so that he had to cough politely before speaking again. To work for such a master is payment enough, he murmured. Temple balance will send out every day, said Min. Tree Ear found himself on the ground collapsed in a full bow of gratitude. It was all he could do to keep himself from running all the way back to the bridge to tell Crane and the good news. Clay today, not wood. Those were men's orders for the tenth day. Once again, Tree Ear trundled the cart, this time along the river road, until he reached the digging area. Here, the clay had been cut away in neat slabs, leaving a pattern of staggered rectangles in the riverbank. Tree Ear paused for a moment when he reached the clay pits. He had passed by the pits many times before and always liked looking at the scene there. The geometric pattern of the clay bank pleased him, but today he felt as though he were seeing the men and boys working there for the first time. Using spades, they splashed at the clay with movements almost too swift to follow. When a slab of clay had been outlined with a spade, it was cut away from the bank and heaved into a nearby cart or basket. Tree and watched for a while, the spade men had given him on his shoulder. Then he slid down the muddy bank to stand in the shallow water. Raising the spade high over his shoulder, he brought it down with a dull thump. It sliced into the wet clay, and Tree Ear noted with satisfaction the clean line made by the spade's edge. He tugged at the spade's handle, ready to make his next cut. The spade did not budge. Tree Ear frowned and pulled again. The head of the spade was well and truly buried. Tree Ear tried using both hands down low on the handle. The clay made its squelching, sucking noises as if it were trying to swallow the spade. Finally, Tree Ear was forced to claw away the clay around the spade head in order to free it. His arms and legs were already covered with mud. He paused to brush away a mosquito and rubbed a swash of mud across one side of his face. At last, he stood up and swung the spade again. It took him all morning to fill the cart with clay. The other diggers were long gone. Having cut their clay with swift skill that left Tree Ear alone and in despair, heavy. The wet clay was far heavier than he'd ever imagined. He could not begin to lift the slab with the spade. He had to cut each slab into several pieces and lift them one at a time into the cart. Tree Ear scowled to see the misshapen masses of clay in the cart, so different from the neat rectangles of the other workers. Moreover, the spade work had torn open his blistered hand again, but it was not so painful as it had been on the mountainside for here he could apply handfuls of cooling, soothing mud to the wound. 
By the time the cart was loaded, tree ear wore mud like a second skin. Even raising his eyebrows was difficult, for his forehead was stiff with dried clay, and he was so exhausted he could bear, hardly bear the thought of wheeling the now heavy cart back to Min's house. And then a sudden thought came to him. Dinner. He had forgotten in the toil of the morning. Apprentices assistant so lowliest workers in every trade, no matter what their status. It was the master's duty to provide a meal for them in the middle of the workday. Now the tree ear was no longer working off of dead, Min was obliged to feed him. The thought broke through tree ear's fatigue like a shaft of sunlight piercing a cloud. He left the cart on the road and bounded into the river. He scrubbed and splashed and ducked under the water completely to get rid of as much grime as he possibly could. It would never do to appear for his first working meal dressed in mud. Min glanced briefly at the clay-filled cart. You were long enough in returning, he said with a sniff. I will not be able to do any more work until after my midday meal. He walked into the house, having said nothing about Tree Ear's food. But Tree Ear barely had time to wonder before Min's wife appeared in the doorway. She held up a parcel tied in cloth. Tree Ear trotted to the door, resisting the impulse to snatch the parcel from her. He bowed his head and held out his palms up together, as was proper for accepting something. Min's wife placed the cloth package in his hands. Eat well, work well, she said. A hot lump rose in Tree Ear's throat. He raised his head and saw in her eyes that she heard his thanks, even though he could not speak the words. Tree Ear sat on the stones under the Pavlonia tree and untied the corners of the cloth. It held a gourd bowl filled with rice, whose whiteness was accented by a few dark shreds of savory dried fish and a little pile of kimchi, pickled cabbage vivid with seasonings of red pepper, green onions, and garlic. A pair of chopsticks was laid neatly across the top of the bowl. Tree Ear picked up the chopsticks and stared for a moment. Of one thing, he was certain. The feast day banquets in the palace of the king could never be better than the modest meal before him, for he had earned it. Tree Ear carted another load of clay for men that afternoon, then returned to the bridge where Craigman had stewed some wild mushrooms for their supper. Tree Ear spoke eagerly about his work that day. It was not until Craigman rose to gather the supper bowls that Tree Ear noticed something was missing. The crutch. Sure enough, after handling tree ear the bowls to wash, Craneville sat down with his knife on a sturdy straight branch and began to whittle a new crutch. Tree ear wiped out the bowls and stacked them neatly on the rock shelf and finally asked, What happened to the old one? Craneman paused in his work and waved his knife impatiently. Stupidity happened, he answered. There was a run of flounder today. That was all he said, but tree ear heard much more. Although Chilful was on the sea, it was a potter's village, not a fishing village. The men and boys seldom took time from their work to fish. Still, they all knew the useful skill of fishing, and the women and girls often gathered shellfish at the low tide. A run of flounder meant a school of the tasty fish had come into shore far closer than usual, the waves even tossed fish right up on the beach. Such news sent many scrambling for bamboo poles. The one had to be among the first to run from the village down to the shore. The flounder found their way back to sea soon enough, and the fish flopping about on the sand were scooped up only by the quickest. It had always been Tree Ear who skipped out to the beach at the first word of flounder run, and he had never returned without a crop fish or two for a rare feast. Now he knew without asking that Crane Man had hobbled down to the beach and lurched about on the sand, so treacherous to his crutch only to come away empty handed. Crane Man shaved another curl of wood then held the crutch up to his eye, squinting to check if the lines were true. I was angry about not getting any fish, he said as he returned to his whittling, so I struck my crutch against a rock. It broke, of course. A little pile of shavings had grown at Craneman's feet. Tree ear crouched and stirred the pile with his finger, too ashamed to look up. In his mind, he saw Craneman making a slow, painful way back from the beach with only a broken crutch to help him and no fish for his trouble. How was it that enjoying his noontime meal, Tree Ear had forgotten his friend? He should have saved some of the food for Crane Man. If it had been the other way around, Crane Man would have never forgotten. Tree Ear swept the shavings into his palm, then threw them into the river. As he watched the current carry them away, he mumbled, I am sorry about the flounder. Ah, oh, friend, Crane Man said, you must mean, I'm sorry about your leg because that was the reason for our fishless supper today. Five think is a waste. 
for either of us to spend too much time in sorrow over something we cannot change. Crane then grunted as he stood, the lean on the new crutch to test it. Satisfied, he nodded at tree ear. Besides, when I leave this world, I will have two good legs. No need for such as this. And he tapped the crutch with his free hand. Still cross with himself, tree ear grumbled half under his breath. Some of us will have four good legs. Crane then batted at him with the new crutch. What are you saying, impudent boy? That I will be a beast in the next life? Tree ear began to protest. No, not you. Then he stopped and grinned. Well, maybe, he said, putting his hand on his chin in an attitude of deep thought. A rabbit, I think. Very clever and quick. You had better be quick now yourself, Crayman bellowed in mock anger, brandishing the crutch sword fashion. Tree ear began hopping about the little den like a little rabbit, dodging Crayman's jabs and swipes, his shame forgotten for the moment as the day ended in laughter. Mm -hmm. Single Shard, Chapter 6.